What do you want to do? I want to make money. I want to be Mrs. Wonderful. <laughs> make you do not want to be Mrs. Okay. Wonderful. Maybe I took it too far. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Rachel. Next into the tank is a mom who turned her homemade kids' clothes into a brand. Hi, my name is Rachel Nilsson, and I am from Alpine, Utah. I am seeking $200,000 for 10% equity stake in my company called Rags to Rachel's. Chloe Harrison! <laughs> oh. oh. So oh. cute. <laughs> Come on! Oh my gosh. Oh I want to get these in the hands of every stylish parent out there. Welcome to the Shark Tank Podcast. Each week, one of the best entrepreneurs from ABC's network smash hit Shark Tank teaches you how to swim with the sharks without being eaten alive. And now your host, serial entrepreneur, TJ Hale. Like, come on, Kev. They were like, who is this chick? Like, awesome. All right. So I want to welcome everyone to the Shark Tank podcast. I'm so jacked. I've got Rachel of Ray, Rags to Rachel's. I want to say Riches every time. Like, I almost always I screw know. it up. That's Rags to Rachel's. Uh, <laughs> you probably remember from season seven. She aired in, what was your air date? Shoot. I didn't uh, write it down. My air date. What was that? You I, don't like, know it either. March 22nd. March, yeah. So it wasn't that long ago. And you already had, and this is the thing that blows my mind. And I mentioned this in our premium content, which by the way, if you're watching and you want to hear the story of how Rachel specifically got on Shark Tank, check out the premium content. It's a separate episode and I'll link to it in the show notes. Uh, but you were talking about uh, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I was talking to a friend about franchising. He's like, yeah, I'm probably going to turn a profit. Like in three years, everything goes well. And Mark Cuban said you were probably the quickest, most profitable company that had ever been in the Shark Tank. And I thought, how awesome of a compliment is that? Maybe I, I will. Like, maybe we will. Rachel, you know, here, that's Rachel here's, where... what, here's what I see. I agree with these guys for the first time. You're killing it. You may be killing the, it. You may be the most profitable from a sales to net profit company that we've had on here in a long time. Wow. Why screw it up? And I thought, I don't think I've ever heard him give that good of a compliment in the Shark Tank that I can remember. I'm At that point, do you feel like you're just, you got them? They're in the palm of your hand. You could do whatever Dude. you want. Yeah, I think when Cuban said that, like my eyes teared up. I was like, I'm going to sit here and start crying. Like <laughs> Your lip like starts shaking. <laughs> yeah, because you work so freaking hard, you know, and to have that, like that to me was the greatest compliment. It was like almost everything else just like blurred out the rest of the episode. I was like, holy cow, that's like, I can't believe that he just said that. It's so cool. Well, I was reading your story about how you and your husband, he's in graduate school. You're doing the student loan. We're broke. We're eating ramen. You've got three kids. Like, I know what that feels like. And so many people can relate with it. This is why Shark Tank's gold, right? Because everyone's sitting there thinking, yeah, probably just like me. And yet in one year, you step up, turn it around and sell three quarters of a million dollars in product on social media with, I'm assuming, no paid advertising whatsoever. Yeah, it was like, great. That's nuts. I mean, how I told him, turn my wife, I'm like, how long will it take you to sell a million dollars worth of product? <clears throat> You start, what do you, what do you got? What are you going to sell? That's a lot of pressure. You can't do that. Yeah. I mean, what, what was your expectation when you started selling the rompers? What did you expect to happen? I mean, were you just hoping to like pay the rent? Maybe I can make 20 bucks a week. What yes. was it? So I remember I started like, like you said, I started selling my kids hand-me-down clothes and that was like, just dude, we need money for food. And then, uh, once that like picked up and I noticed people were seriously buying the stuff I made for them, for my kids, um, I was like, I'm going to start selling clothes. Like, so I posted the romper that I put on my toddler and the reaction was seriously, it, the coolest part about social media is the reaction and everything is instantaneous. Like you can post something on there and see immediately if people are going to take to it or not. So I had already built like a small base. I think I had like 2000 people just buying my hand-me-down clothes for my kids. Right. And then I threw that up there as a test. Like I love this thing because I put it on my toddler every single day. I'm going to try it and see if other people feel the same way. The second I posted it immediately, I had people so excited about it. So then I started sewing, making them. And there was a point when I was telling my husband, we are in grad school, we're totally broke. But I remember telling him, hey, I'm going to make six figures this year. Like you watch me. And he looked at me and I'm sure he was just like, bless your freaking heart. <laughs> bless your but heart. But like 
he can't say that, you know, so he's like, cool, cool, like, good for you, you know, go for it. But I'm sure watching, he was just like, she's working so hard, bank account was staying so level, like, we didn't have any gains for so much, you know, so much time, because I was rolling money back into the company, that finally, I was able to make gains and make it work. But I never in a million years, like, after a year and a half, we made a million dollars, I never in a million years would have been able to say, holy cow, like, we sold a million dollars worth. Okay, of time out. Question: Looking back, let me just make sure we're recording here because that would be I'm li- like live in fear that that's not working. All right, <laughs> looking back, when a couple questions. One, when you said selling hand me downs, you weren't making anything yet. You were just selling secondhand clothes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's how this all began. That's why I came up with the name Rags to Rages because I wanted to sell my kids hand me downs on a se- separate outlet. Okay, so then you post the romper, but you're not selling it. You're just like, hey, do you guys like this? You didn't have yeah, like, like 10 of them hey, that you already made. Exactly. Like this is coming soon. I actually said that just because I wanted to see the reaction. And the reaction was incredible. So that's when I was like, holy crap. Like I got to get a million of my husband's T-shirts and cut these things. <laughs> well, so he's a big T-shirt buff. Was he like a Utah sweet bro? Did he have all the tight shirts in the closet? <laughs> guy if you heard that if you heard that he's actually the opposite but he had like you know that's like t-shirt jeans like pretty pretty plain dude what, so. what was the first shirt logo that you sold do you remember what it was it was so duh duh was my very first thing because i say that literally all the time i'm actually surprised i haven't dud you today because i literally say duh all the time is so, that a good thing like have i been above the duh line or am i not no, worth the duh what's it's what's so the deal? good yeah no duh is good like come on duh that's so that hilarious. was the first thing I put on it. Like second I screen printed though, like I printed that on there, put it on there and people were loving it. All right. So tell me about the early stages of Instagram pricing model. Like, are you just going, all right, well, I'm cause when you're a new entrepreneur, you're scared to death. That, like people are going to think you're ripping them off or you're charging too much and they have no idea what it takes to make them. What was, what did the first one cost? So the first one I sold for $20 and that to me was awesome. Um, but I was cutting and sewing and everything. So my total like time and everything is probably, I probably wasn't making a ton of money. You're making, but like, your hourly was like $20 every two days, basically. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But this is my theory. Like, and I don't know if this will be helpful to your listeners, but <laughs> I was, I was thinking, you know, I don't want to start too high because I don't want people to immediately be turned off. I want to get these in people's hands and have them try it. And then once there's a higher demand, then you can start demanding a higher price. But at the beginning, I was like, no, like I, I mean, and I probably wasn't making hardly anything. And I think my husband was a little bit discouraged by that. But I was like, I just want to see the reaction that people love it. I want them to have them. No, you're smart. I mean, that's the Silicon Valley model, right? Everything, you get the free 30 days, the free 14 days, you get the Amazon pricing. And as soon as they get you locked, then the price can start going up and you'll say, yeah, that's fine. I yeah, like and I I still continued trying to make it so it's affordable for everybody. You know, a lot of times people wonder, like, even on the show on Shark Tank, they were asking, like, okay, so you sell these between thirty seven and fifty bucks, like forty seven bucks, right? And yeah. okay, that could be shocking, but if you think about it, it's a t shirt and pant, and and this is what they didn't put on the show, um, probably because of time I was actually in there forever. But I was like, this is a t shirt and a pant. A lot of parents spend. 20 bucks on a t-shirt and 20 bucks on a pair. Yeah. Like, yeah. So I mean, Costco helps. They get the price down a little bit, but here's the, here's the area I will disagree with you on when you just said that you try to make it affordable for everyone. So I actually think a product for everyone is, a, this is a maxim, right? So it's not always applicable, but a product for everyone is also a product for no one. So you have yeah. to define who the market is. Like Susan Peterson's very solid about this. If you're not, if you love my moccasins, and you're not willing to pay the 50 bucks, then there is a $20 product out there, but that she can't have both of those customers. Maybe that's changed since I talked to her, but you you can't do both. Yeah. You know, I guess I should have not completely said that because you're right. It is, it is kind of a niche item, you know, but at the same time, I didn't want to go crazy and take advantage of my customers and be like, Oh, Hey, you know, I'm going to sell these things for 80 bucks. I wanted to keep it within reason. You know, I start, I start at 20 and I, ended at 37. So it, it's kind of more like everybody could afford one, right? There's one yeah. mom who's going to buy a five a week, like for one for every day of the week. And there's the other mom who's going to have the one and totally you're there. Yeah, But you do have to be so careful because that's, that's kind of the cool part about our product is it is exclusive and it is, it is kind of a higher end, cool, stylish outfit. You know, you're not going to be able to get it at a target or a Walmart or something like that, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah. And that was kind of the, I would say the crux of the conversation. It centered around this idea of what to do with the brand and how to protect the brand and the integrity of the brand versus licensing. And I thought that was pretty fascinating because you're in a spot now where you're making good money, but you're not a $5 million company. You're not over that threshold. You're not, you haven't been around long enough to know what's going to happen. So you got to be very, very careful about how you expand and if you can continue to do what you've done in the past, or if there's always this urge and this happened in the show to reach out and to expand into retail and to try new things. And I think it was Kevin who said, you see other companies doing it. So you automatically think I have to do that too. And sometimes like, Oh, it's Cuban. Yeah. And that sometimes that's the last mistake that you make. You know what? That's like, I totally agree with you, Mark. But you didn't though, right? Because on one hand, totally awesome. It's great. I agree with you, Mark. But then on the other hand, it's, Oh yeah. Retail stores, right? Totally. Awesome. We want to do it. Here's the deal. I would go nuts. I would go nuts. Here's the deal, Mark. I am not sure if I want to go that route. You're trying to play a whole nother game and you don't know if you should play. You've seen other people play, so maybe I should play because other companies are bigger. You are great at designing, getting people to trust you, and selling them a great product online at huge margins that's profitable to you. I love it. (laughs) <laughs> but you then all of a sudden when someone else talks to you, right? Wholesale. <laughs> oh, yeah, da, 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 but because I, I don't know. Here's the deal. Here's the deal, right? You can't make up your mind about making up your mind. So for those reasons, I'm out. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Was it the purple hair? Like Cuban, I think you made him a little nervous. I think he was scared. <laughs> it was very he was scary. afraid of the purple. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we'll get to that. But I want to talk about your journey to Shark Tank, your ideal outcome, and also the fact that you chose Robert, which you mentioned that Damon was your friend when your kid was handing him the clothes. I'm like, oh, there's a subtle hint. Like her and Damon are friends already. He's the fashion guy. But when you got there, like what was your objective? What was the ideal outcome? Did you have, would you plan that far ahead or were you just raging it? Like, hey, I'm here. I'm good to go. Let's see what happens. I love that you say where you just raging it. You already get me, which is so cool because- Duh. A lot, duh. So a lot of people ask this, you know, like, hey, did you have an idea? So obviously I had an idea, you know, Damon is the clothing guy. And I think so many people were really expecting me to go with Damon because of that. And, and going out there, I knew I just wanted to see how this played out. I knew you could go out there and they literally could hate every single thing about you and your brand. You have no idea. So in my case, I was like, you know, best case scenario, I get an offer. And, um, luckily I had three, uh, really good ones and Damon was great. And I, I think that's kind of who I expected I would go with, but, uh, at the end of the day, just, he just didn't have my same vision. And, and that was kind of what determined my, the end result there. Yeah. And you mentioned tipsy elves. So it it was very different version vision. In fact, I have some notes here. So look, I mean, look, we're doing work here. Starting at the beginning, the first question was, why aren't you making more? So as impressive as it was that you'd made 280000 in the 12-month period, on $800,000 in sales, where's the rest of the profit? You're all online. you got a great margin. Uh, and just to remind people, 7 to $10 to produce, 37 to $50 to purchase. And you mentioned inventory. So I'm sure you've learned a lot since this point, but it's a fair question. Where was all the money going? Was that like were the school loans like sucking it up? Were they garnishing your wages or what? I'm so glad you asked. Uh, the funny thing is, is I really haven't been paying myself a ton because my husband lucked out and got a really great job and that helped a ton. So uh, none of it's going into people's salaries or whatever. What they didn't show, um, was we, when, when it was talking about inventory, a lot of the money has been tied up into raw goods. So I was buying, fabric and and that's what sparked Cuban when he was like oh so you are like half a million dollars profit and that's what sparked Cuban's comment was because I had no debt and everything was paid for that was coming like spring summer and fall in the manufacturer like it was all paid for sitting there raw goods like we don't have we didn't have a ton of inventory sitting on our shelves that was made and produced because that was kind of our problem was we couldn't keep it on our shelves that's you know but what we did have was debt free tons of raw good raw material that we were actually you had like a Joanne's fabrics, right? Like in the warehouse, totally. just, okay, yeah. cool. Which was really usable and really worth a lot of money. And that's so, kind of what was so impressive to Cuban. So that didn't fit in the narrative. They just kind of left that out of the edit. Okay. Yeah. Got it. All right. Well, that answers that question. That's great. The one I want to go back to is Kevin asked this question. I'll go ahead and play it. 
And he says, aren't you worried people are going to try to rip this off? Rachel, are you worried when somebody sees this, they could simply knock it off at a much lower price? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that because we so actually... So am I, actually. <laughs> we've, run into, we've run into people trying to knock off rags. What, the, what stops? And what happened? The coolest part is I honestly feel like we've established a brand. People love rags. They love the uniqueness of it. I feel like I pour a little bit of me into the brand and they become a fan of not only my brand, but me. I put a face on it and they love that. Well, let's tap into our resident clothing expert here. What do you think of that statement, Damon? That it's protectable by that brand no, alone. That they, no. it'll protect her. Not at all. I think that she has a great following, but if another maker, and they will copy it, puts it out there, it's a big world. You know, they just yeah, wouldn't, totally. you know, and they what, just won't. What would they happens. sell it for? She's at 50 bucks. What would they sell? It all depends on the chain. So if this was going into the mass market, it would probably be 19 99 At the most, yeah, at the most. So when you're going on Shark Tank and you do a piece of clothing, you have to expect that question. That was like the number one question that I knew I was going to get. Right. And like like I said, I think a lot of people not only love the brand and the quality and, and the practicality of it, but they also loved me. And I think, like I said, there's so many people out there that, that could copy and they do. Um, but at the end of the day, people are – they know they're going to get the best romper from rags. They know that they're going to get a piece of me in every single piece of their clothing. They know that they're, you know what I mean? And a ton of that is invaluable. And I think that's why Robert kind of argued with Damon on that is because there is something to be said about a really great brand. And I think that's what, that's one of the hardest things to accomplish when you're doing clothing is to create a really cool brand with hype and people want it. And, and I think Robert totally understood that from the get-go and understood what I had going. I mean, we had at the time when I, when I was on there, we had a hundred thousand Instagram followers. And then not only that, we had private Facebook groups on Facebook that I had no idea about of moms styling their kids in these rags. Shut and up. And yes, I'm not kidding. Wow. And, and they didn't house. even invite you. How rude. I know. Isn't that mean? But it's so cool, you know, because literally it's created this kind of, mayhem in the social media marketplace in a good way and 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 then not only that the business model is kind of interesting like we we sell a lot of limited edition and and once it's gone it's gone and so when when the when I run across groups like that on Facebook or on Instagram or or even moms that are in my same boat that are going to grad school they they actually have stopped to tell me hey my husband's in grad school too but we buy rags because we can sell them on Instagram after they're done and we can get our money back because they know that we're never going to come out with that same romper ever again. You know what? So the, the exclusive one, that was genius. I watched right? that and thought, where did that come from? <laughs> so that's kind of cool. And, and, and it's, it's, it's great because we are a smaller company that we can be really flexible. And I hope to be able to continue that forever. Yeah, you're doing like the inverse Chuck Taylor, right? There's not one original. There's just like everyone's an original and yeah, they're never coming so back. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the thing you're talking about, I want to talk to the audience about this because this is critical, you know, being behind the scenes, what's interesting. And you mentioned this too, you've had other shark tank entrepreneurs come to you and ask how you do what, what's the magic on Instagram? Can you help them? And a lot of them have shark deals, right? Mm -hmm. I get calls from people who are like, Hey, help me prepare for my airing. And I find out later that, cause I, I try not to press them. They've got to deal with the shark. I'm like, what do you need my help for? And there's this perception that the sharks have all the answers and it's just not true. I mean, there's a couple of people I interviewed. I found out later hired people that I know in the digital marketing industry to help them do the things that the sharks got credit for. There are people that the sharks go to, to say, how to help me fix this client, help me sort out, you know, whether it's the, the uh, email automation or the digital marketing or the email capture or the social media. Like it's not just that they don't have time to do it. It's that you're doing something that corporations are astroturfing. They're trying, like when they ask you how you're going to compete with a knockoffs, the knockoffs and the big corps are asking how they're going to compete with your brand relationship. Like they can't woo your customers away from you. And the more rages that are out there building these niches and tribes, the less power they have to woo those customers. Like, I think that's the lesson for me that I saw from your segment. They're asking you how you're going to protect your brand. And I'm thinking, well, how are, how are people going to steal your product? How are people going to steal your brand awareness and your tribe? They're not going to, unless you screw it up. Yeah. A lot of pressure. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, you, you must be seeing that like as long as, and the point is, as long as your tribe is growing faster than someone saying, well, I'll buy a $20 romper somewhere else, you don't actually have a problem. You know what? I love that you brought that up because it's exactly, I'm running into that like all of the time where 
big giant companies are coming to me and asking, hey, I need help with our Instagram because they see the power in it. Yes. They see the power in social media and the loyalty of my customers and the loyalty of, and that is seriously, like to me, that is worth so much more than any dollar I could ever make, you know, is creating such a cool customer fan base and a lot and 99% of that probably 100% of that is because of social media and because of and so many people like you said like corporate level they don't understand that they don't they can't wrap their brain around and even that. if they understand it i mean they might have their own private following they can't implement it at such a high they don't know how to do it yeah. And so I call it the Doritos principle. I just made that up because I feel like Doritos is the first, you know how they do the Super Bowl commercials where oh. they ask people to make their own. And that one's usually like in the top three of all the commercials. Yeah. Why is that? Because it's someone out there who's way better than your collective geniuses in your corporation that are stale. And that's the same thing that's happening in social media. Like you're the Doritos girl of clothes on Instagram and there are others like you, but no big core, like old Navy can't do what you do. They never could. Well, I can't relate to old Navy either. You know what I mean? Like, I don't see one person in Old Navy that is like, you know what? I can relate to that person. I'm going to go support Old Navy. And I think as far like it's been studied that people that have an emotional connection with the brand are so much more likely to stay with that brand and be loyal and continue to purchase from that brand than than the opposite. And that is why Instagram and social media is so effective because emotionally you can connect with people that you know other, otherwise couldn't do. You know? Yeah. And I think anytime someone comes in like you and they've got a big social media following that's generating all their sales, all the sharks are ultimately interested. And I don't think it's purely financial. I think they want their aqua hiring. They want you and their family so they can glean those lessons and help their other entrepreneurs because that's, it's very difficult to do. You mentioned your friendship with Susan. She had a deal with Damien that didn't go through. Uh, did you guys talk about that at all? I mean, was there any discussion? Uh, the same thing, right? Damon wanted her in the brand, didn't happen. She didn't need a shark. What was your mindset going in in terms of, um, you know, I guess that's not really that good of a question, in terms of whether or not you needed the deal to go through or you need 200000 when you've got three hundred grand in the bank? Like, I, how much of that was weighing in your mind in, in terms of a partnership? Yeah, so that actually is a good question, and I was asked that on the show, and I don't even know. I can't remember if they even showed that, but I remember it so well. So I remember uh, they did kind of touch on it in the in the edit, but I remember Robert asking, like, why the heck you don't need us, Rach? Like, why? Because I had so much cash in the bank, um, and I, I just told him, and I was totally honest. I just said, you know, if I was coming here just for a loan, you know, I could have walked into any bank and got a loan. And I said, that's not why I'm here. I'm here because I want to find a, a partner that has the expertise that you have, the connections that you have, something that could grow my business on another level. And and that's why I felt like I wanted to do Shark Tank. It wasn't because I just needed the investment in the cash. And that's not what I was interested in because, like I said, I could have walked into any bank and probably got that as a loan or a line of credit. And that was something that was never interesting to me. So and immediately when when I – that was my rebuttal. It just shut them all up because that, that is true. That's a good answer. Yeah. Yeah. To me, the connections and the, and the expertise and their brain power is way more valuable than even cash. So I remembered my question from earlier when I asked you like that three part one, it was how many times did you tell something to your husband? And he's like, sure, Rachel, bless your heart. Go back outside woman, please. Like how many times did he totally just, um, I don't want to use the word I'm thinking like, you know what I mean? Yeah. So he, I mean, bless my heart and bless his heart. He was so supportive, but at the same time, I think he was just trying to break it to me. Like, dude, like you're working. There was one specific conversation and I totally remember it. And it was in the summer he was studying. Uh, he, he, he's actually an attorney. So he was studying for the bar. And, um, so student loans were up and we had no money and he couldn't even work as like an intern anywhere or anything because he needed to study all the time. Right, right. So I remember sitting on the couch one morning, it was Saturday and I was so discouraged because my, my PayPal balance or my bank account balance was seriously staying at this number. And I was like, dude, I'm like working so hard every day, all day. And it's not making any gains. And he was like, Rach, like it's time to just throw in the towel, like bless your heart. You know, you're doing so so good and you you this is like something that you love but you I'll always love you you know even yeah, if like, you can't make yeah. money you're working so hard like I think he just felt for me you know like I was so discouraged and frustrated that and then there wasn't any like 
real gains until I spoke with my dad, who is an entrepreneur. Um, he was like, I've never seen anything like this. Like you can't quit. So it was kind of a moment where he was like, bless your heart. I'm not going to be mad if you quit, but like, I don't blame you either. Like this is so much time and work and like, you're not making a ton of money. So you get your dad on one side, your husband on the other side and they're like, that's but, awesome. you know, it was good. It was like, it was like, I felt that he'd support me either way, whatever I did, you know, I didn't need to make all this money and kind of have that pressure of, of helping out the family. He was like ultra supportive either way, whatever I decided. But I think he was kind of like, Oh, this is brutal. Yeah. So is it patronization or were you like cracking and he's trying to be there to put you back together? I, I think it was 100% cracking and he was just trying to put me together. I, I've never felt that he was like now, you know, obviously he's always been my biggest fan, which is so helpful. You kind of have to have that. But I feel like he maybe thought sense that I felt pressure to help the family out, you know, where we didn't have any money and we, and I wanted to bring in some extra income. Well, yeah, now he has to be respectful because now he's hanging on for the ride, right? He can't let go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now yeah. you got options. <laughs> I'm totally joking. I'm just, uh, I'm just picturing that conversation between my wife and I. She's like, who's making the money now? All right. Go clean the kitchen. Uh, uh so what was, this is really interesting to me. If you were flatlined for a while, you're putting in all the effort, you're not getting ahead. What was the event? What was the catalyst? What kind of shot you up? Where did you finally catch a trajectory? Okay. So that's a good question too. I was always rolling the money back in, you know, because like I said, I was sewing and cutting everything myself. So every little bit of money I needed to go buy more inventory. It was literally like every week I was buying inventory over and over and over fabric and whatever to sew. So the moment I realized like, okay, this is actually catching on. I need to pull my head out and get this thing manufactured because there's no way I can keep up. That's when I, I got the money and I put it towards the manufacturing side of things. And it was really freaking scary because I found myself at the edge of this cliff, like, holy cow, this is a lot of money. I don't know, like, am I that confident in my brand? Like this is four months in, five months in. If I jump, like I could just lose everything. So it was definitely a risk, but once I did that and I had product to put on my shelves, it immediately, it was, it's like crazy. I think we did like 14,000 one month and the next month it jumped to 40,000. Nice. So yeah, so it was such a good decision and that was because I actually had product now that, that people, I wasn't selling out in two minutes, you know? Were you snarky with your husband or did you run in like you just got the Ed McMahon like publisher's clearinghouse check? Like, ah, yeah, really Wonka? I don't think I was ever snarky because I understood where he was coming from. You know, like if I ever felt like, oh, you didn't believe in me, then maybe you'd get a little snarky rage. But because I knew he was so stoked and supportive, dude, that guy was like asking me every day, how's it going? How's it going? So amped on it, you know? So I've never felt that. Do you need a lawyer? Do you need an attorney? I know one. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And you. now he has a great job too. So it kind of all happened like at once and it was so exciting for everybody. They work new lawyers like dogs. I imagine at some point he's gonna be like, so who's the CEO here? Do you have any job openings? <laughs> for real. Um, all right. So I'm going to get back to the discussion on the show and one, well, let's play the clip of Mark saying that um, you're killing it, but you, why screw it up? And ultimately that you've met his deal quota, which was pretty funny and kind of harsh. Here's the deal. Here it is. Because I don't know. Here's the deal. Here's the deal, right? Rachel, (laughs) you've exceeded my here's the deal quota. I'm out. Thanks, Mark. So how disappointed were you that was Mark in your future, like in your mind, or were you okay with this? Because... Okay. So like, like we mentioned prior, like Mark gave me the greatest compliment of my life. So anything he said after that, it was like, oh, it's cool. It's cool. Like whatever, you know, just because I was still like on a high from his you're the most profitable company on the team. Yeah, yeah. So cool, like, wait, what? You know? You're going out? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but to be completely honest with you, I knew he was going to go out before I even went on the show. I just didn't, I've never, like when I watch Mark, I've never seen him totally completely interested in a baby line or baby anything, you know? He hates so, babies, I know. Yeah, he hates babies. <laughs> I don't know what he's doing. Just Why does he hate babies? But, but I was so not even, that did not even surprise me. What did surprise me? And I actually knew he would maybe razz me a little bit because of that. So I was like, he's not going to be interested. And and maybe, you know, for ratings or whatever, he's going to razz me, which he totally did. But at the same time, I was, I didn't expect that compliment either. So I was cool with whatever. And I, they, you know, he had to give me a hard time and it was fun and we were laughing and he was so freaking nice that it didn't even like, I don't know. It didn't really shake me. All right. Nice. So I'm, I'm like one of the, I go off on tangents all the time. Maybe you can respect that. I think after that I would have made a full size 
here's the deal romper and sent it to him. I know everybody, everybody after that airing was like, you need to put, here's the deal on a romper. Yeah. Six to- foot though. Like six, two for <laughs> Cuban. I, yeah. I'll do one for myself. I'll call it the momper. Yeah. Yeah. And post on Instagram, tag him. He'll see it. <laughs> he hearts yeah. my stuff on Instagram like that. He's all, he's social media crazy, man. I don't know how he does That's it. Cool. That's so cool. Forgot who's not selling a product on social. Maybe he is selling himself, but nuts. Um, yeah. All right. So that was Right. Awesome compliment. Now at this point, Damon, Robert, Kevin start to hash it out. All right. So I'm very interested in this. You obviously have followed tipsy elves. You like what Robert's done with the company. Uh, he said, look, I've done 15 million in sales all online. And not only that, you've got all these different directions you're going in. We'd had that same conversation. We do everything online. Just makes the most sense. Kevin says something wonderful has done 500 million in sales. Your 15 million is a nothing burger. Now that's a big number. I didn't realize it was anywhere near that. Mm-hmm. Um, did you give any serious consideration to Kevin when he was making his hard pitch to join the something wonderful family? You know, I love Kevin and I really was, I was actually really shocked by his offer because there was no royalties. It wasn't like sticky, you know? And so I was expecting something where he was going to, to be honest, like it was kind of the same thing as Cuban. Like when I went in there, I knew I could make Kevin my friend because I like him. Like he didn't, I think his personality is genius. I think he's hilarious, you know? So I was like, I hope he razzes me because I can take it, you know? And so, you know, the moment I got in there, I was like calling him Kev. And I remember Lori was like, Kevin, she just called you Kev. And they all laughing. And, you know, so right off the bat, I was like, this guy, this guy and I are going to be buddies, you know, but I didn't expect an offer. So it's like probably maybe most people that you talk to, they go in there and they're, they're they're expecting, you know, this is the kind of shark that I want to work with or this one, you know, I had to pick two. And honestly, the two that I was like most interested in was Damon and Robert. And so that was kind of what I spent the most time researching. Yeah. You kind of got a blind spot for Kevin for practical purposes. I hate to say that, but yeah, as far as like a business, I was most interested in Robert and Damon and I kind of wanted to see even if they would be interested, which luckily they totally were, obviously they wanted to take it in different directions. So when Kevin offered me something, I was just flattered. I was like, dang, this guy, like, that's so cool, you know? But that's as far as it went. Like, yeah, yeah. No kiss at the door for Kevin. All right. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, and I was looking at thinking, you know, I've, he doesn't, obviously Robert has the tipsy elves and he had a lot of good advice, but at that point, Kevin does have the stronger network. There's something wonderful. I didn't realize the number was that high, but I've interviewed a couple of those entrepreneurs and they love each other and they really do good business together. You got the bottle breacher, you got the honey fund. Um, I'm sure obviously wicked good cupcakes, but he's, he's built up a pretty decent network there. So I was curious if that was something you were going to take. And then Damon says, look, if you want to really take your competitors out, you license the product, you give them something for it. They're either going to make money off them or you're not, it's your choice. And they had a big disagreement. They had a little, they had a little, um, no, I think you're wrong. And he said that Robert said it's going to kill your brand. You asked if you should knock off yourself. And then Damon made the same $200,000 offer for 20% that Robert had made. And I don't remember what Kevin's offer was. I don't have it written down. It was the same. Okay. Same thing. Uh, they argued about licensing. Lori said she'd make the exact same deal as Damon, which Lori was kind of a non-factor. Did she speak at all aside from the Kev reference during this segment? She spoke a ton. I was actually surprised. Oh, really? A ton of yeah, but a lot of it was just really complimentary. Like, Rachel, you are a designer and what you've created here is so cool. And and she didn't make an offer literally up until like she didn't go out up until the very, very, very last minute. So she she asked me before she made an offer, like, what, you know, what why should I make an offer? And I basically just told her like, well, number one, I'm standing here. It's been one year in business. Number two, I have almost a hundred thousand followers throughout my social media. I'll, you know, I told her like, this is, I know I can kill it. But at the end of the day, she was right. Well, I'm so. doing, I'm doing my Sigmund Freud here because before you said that I, my impression from the show was that she waited that long because she was trying to figure out what her strategic advantage was. Yeah. And so when she said, well, Damon already made you the offer. He's a great partner. To me, that's her conceding that she can't convince you to choose her over the other people. So for you to say, why should I make you an offer? That's kind of like when you're dating and you're like, well, what do you like about me? Like what ammunition can I fire back at you later? Yeah. And, yeah. and there was nothing there for, in my opinion, there's nothing there for Lori to say, this is why I'm your girl. So there's no, there's yeah. not, all she could do is lose face by making an offer. It's so true. Um, and then Robert said, do we have a deal at 15%? You asked him if you take 15. He said, well, do we have a deal? But they didn't really confirm whether or not you took 20 or 15. Like I scratched my head and said, well, which, 
which one was it? Was it 15 or 20? Did yeah, they... so it was 15. Okay. And he reiterated, reiterated that like 15% for 200,000. And I was like, yes, but they didn't show that part. Yeah, so, I was like, yeah. What happened? Yeah. <laughs> the magic of TV. Yep. Cool. All right. Well, um, I think there's a lot of questions I have. I think probably the biggest question that most people would have for you is tell us about how you pulled this off with Instagram. Like, I want you to write the Bible of Instagram. So I think rather than kind of go into that today, I think it'd be actually be cool if we put something together that people can review and kind of follow in Rachel's footsteps, because that is the real takeaway of this, like making a quarter million dollars or 500 grand on Instagram in one year. Like that's for me, that's the story. So, um, I am curious how often you post if you work alone or if your team posts for you and if you monitor everything yourself, can you kind of tell us about that a little bit? Yeah. So, um, social media is a beast. And like, like I said, it's, it's so cool. And that's kind of how I got started. So that's been one of the things I do have a team, but that's been one of the things that I haven't given up. And I think there's certain things that owners don't want to give up. And that kind of is my thing. You know, I feel like I, the reason why I got as far as I got is because I market to myself pretty much. I am my target market. I am my consumer. I'm a young mom. I dig fashion, but I also love stuff that's really comfortable and, um, unique, you know? So no, and, and then I have three young boys, you know, so I kind of know, and I think that's what has gotten me as far as I've gotten is I am my target market. I'm marketing to myself. I am the consumer. I like to be completely me and real and authentic. And I people, I think people really like that on Instagram. So it's been really hard for me to give that up. As far as other social outlets where, you know, Facebook and the Pinterest and Twitter and stuff like that, I have had other people helping me with those outlets. Um, but Instagram's kind of been my baby, and I, I don't know if I ever want to let go of that. Yeah, well, it's that's what you're best at, right? That It's like saying, well, are you going to let someone make the clothes for you, design the clothes for you? Probably yeah. not for a long time. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So what's one of the things that happened from Shark Tank, from you being this breakout star that maybe you didn't expect? What's I mean, aside from people saying, hey, take a selfie with me, like deeper down than that, what's something that's come out of it that's really surprised you? Well, I think like – I think at the end of my episode when you guys got tears was that was like literal shock. Like I cannot believe that I did this. Like you go from zero for real bottom of the freaking barrel to like eight months later, you're filming in front of these people that you've been watching on TV for the last five year, five, six years. It's like, it was so unbelievable but it also like proved to me that Rach, you can do anything and you, the sky is the limit. And honestly, like if you can create positive energy and good vibes and whatever, like you really can do anything. There's nobody that's telling you, you cannot do it. And I'm sh- so many people were probably like, yeah, right. Yeah, right. Like, good luck. Good luck. But it happened. And that to me, like is a lesson that number one, like I would never tell anybody that came to me with an idea or something crazy off the, out of the box. You can't do that because I've done something that I think 90% of people in the world would be like, there's no freaking way, you know? So that's like a huge giant takeaway. And, and as far as like when people come to me and they want help or consulting or whatever, I have always uh, encouraged it, always encouraged like, yes, try it, try it, try it because I did. And it worked, you know, you only live once and you might as well shoot for the stars. Really? That's so cliche, but it's so true. Yeah. kind of, we got to give a shout out to Richie Norton, who you're friends with and you know, his wife, we talked about that. I had him on my show. Love Richie. So he wrote, start something stupid. He's been on my show. I'll link to the show notes. If, if you're, if you like the answer that Rach just gave about, well, starting something stupid and just going for it, Richie's book will speak to you. So I'll link to it and they should check it out because it's phenomenal. And he's, he's working with John Lee Dumas right now. They just sold like a half a million dollars worth of the freedom journal on Kickstarter last month. I mean, crazy, crazy numbers. So One month. Cool. Yeah, couldn't be like better people for that to happen to yeah, us. I'm so yeah. excited for him. He lives out here. I don't see him very often. I got to go catch up with him. But um, yeah. are there any mistakes that you made that you would take back? Like any big glaring ones that kind of seem stupid now that you look back, you're like, what was I thinking? You know, Is there anything that stands yeah. out to you? Big, giant, huge mistakes. Yeah, I in terms mistakes. of the Shark Tank tsunami, in terms of maybe marketing oversight, you know, anything that costs you a ton of money that seems kind of stupid or foolish? Yeah, I mean, I think... I, like I said, I make, I've made mistakes. I think at the end of the day, it's just, I mean, I, I did have a couple glitches where it was like, oof, what was I thinking? And a lot of it, I can tell you right now, like I have followed my gut 99% of the way 
and I didn't follow my gut with one thing and it could have been huge, massive problem for us. And luckily I was able to get out of that and move on and kind of repair. And, and that was just giving up some control on social stuff that I wasn't comfortable with. So it was sounded like some kind of partnership or agreement. And it wasn't, and, and luckily I was able to walk away and it was fine and everything was good. But at the end of the day, what I learned from that was I didn't follow my gut. And when you have like an immediate instinct like that, or when you have something where you can't quite, you can't quite understand why you feel that way because everything else sounds and makes really great sense just go with your gut because I've done that and it's gotten me this far, but there's been a couple setbacks where I'm like, dang it, I wish I would have just stuck with my gut and, and known that this is, you know what I mean? Like it, it sounded so good on paper, but at the end of the day, it just didn't pan out. And luckily like we're still, everything's running smoothly and everything's good. And it wasn't a huge giant catastrophe, but I could totally foresee something like that happening where, I would have really regretted it. So I was grateful for that. And now I've learned so much. Like you, it's amazing how much you can learn in two years, like crash course. And in the inverse of that, this is probably the last question I have for you. Cause I'm, you know, when your Instagram feed starts to grow, I remember Susan telling me, she's like, once you get that 10 K, then you get that hundred K and it just puts you in a, in another, uh, a stage of your business, like another ballpark. Mm -hmm. So what's the most effective thing for you in terms of acquiring new quality, loyal supporters? Like, is there one, is it a combination or like a recipe or is there something that works better? Is it contests? Is it a uh, post about you personally? Is it about collaboration with other large brands and like sharing visitors? What, which one's your, your jam? So I think a lot of times, like I think a lot of people get sucked up in the giveaways and the contests and stuff like that. That's been something that I've been really leery about. I don't really necessarily like that because I feel like you're not gaining real loyal, solid customers. You're gaining people that want free stuff. Agreed. Right? I've so, learned that on my own platform. Like free stuff is not good in terms yeah, of building so, a brand. Like, it's great to help out other brands and to kind of get new eyes and stuff. So you have to be really careful with what you post. Um, as far as like content and, and continuing on and getting, cause Susan is right. Like once you hit certain milestones in the social media game, you have to play it a little bit differently. And I think a lot of it is just stay true to me and and I think people like I want to I want to embed a little bit of me into every single post so whether that be a picture of me with my kids or whatever cuz I think I think people like my brand is because they can relate to me. And so I kind of have to cater that, you know, I, I, I don't want to let them in completely on my life, but at the same time I want to let them in like, Hey, I'm a mom. This is so cool. This is, you know, and, and that's where I've seen the most success. The most interaction is, is where I've been completely authentic with my life and me and my customers and my product. So awesome. And that's kind of what I'm going to keep doing. So I told you in our pregame, my wife called me cause I was out of town and she's like, uh, I'm watching shark tank. You got to have this girl on your show. Like her product is amazing. She's amazing. She's got a deal. I'm like, why are you spoiling it for me? Shut up. She's <laughs> like, no, seriously. Her name is Rachel. And then you, because I'm lazy and I'm behind schedule, you actually contacted me to come on, which I'm so grateful for because you were phenomenal. You were outstanding. And I'm really excited to see what you're able to make of this company and how far you take it. And the thing you said earlier about like, you're there on stage after watching it for so long. I think people need to realize if they're watching it and they're running a business and hoping like in season five, you didn't have a business. You had nothing. And you're already on the show. Like in America, I was just listening to Jim Rome talk about this the other day. What, if you're in America, like what's your excuse? There is none. Like you can do yeah. anything. And now in the era of social media, which didn't exist back then, a quarter, half a million dollars in one year. Oh, and you mentioned you'd have a million dollars in sales by December. Now it's the following March. Like can you, how was the shark tank tsunami? How much revenue are we talking about? Can you give me numbers or are you a little hesitant about that? I'm a little hesitant, but I can tell you like we've easily doubled. So we're on track to do really well, I think. Okay. All right. It's crazy. It's so cool. Good for you. Good for so you. With what, with what you said, I do want to touch on that because I remember we were at my house. Like I did a lot of this out of my house and, um, we actually had shelving in my garage and I remember we were featured in Vogue. And there was only me and two other people at the time that were full time. And then we had a part time person coming in and helping. And I was like, you know what? This is so crazy because Vogue reached out and they wanted to feature us. Um, I was like, if people only knew that we were doing this from my house and shipping and doing everything out of my garage, like, I don't think that they would ever, ever 
believe that, you know, but it comes to, to show like the American dream is real and you don't need, I actually do remember somebody coming and telling me like, you're not legit because you don't have a warehouse, you don't have a building, you don't have a retail front. And, and I was like, you know what, that's so sad that people think like that because you can be as legit as you want and still do everything out of the basement of your home. And that's so cool. Which is where you were living at your in-laws or parents at the time when you started? Yeah, my parents. So we were my parents and, and I started in their basement. And then eventually we were able to move to a house and it just grew from there. So Yeah. And I, the whole thing about the garage, like where do you think the first Apple was sold from? Totally. Give me a break. Yeah. So cool. All right. Well, we salute you. Uh, hello to your fans who are watching this. I hope they enjoyed it. I hope they'll check out other Shark Tank podcasts. But I'm just really grateful that you came on and uh, shared your heartfelt story. And I hope it inspires people. I'm sure you get emails from people who are like, hey, I'm just starting out. Here's my product. You've inspired me. And I know when I get those, that's like the thing that makes my day more than anything. That makes it worth yeah. it. You're like you're changing yeah. people's lives. Yep. I agree with you totally. That makes everything worth it. 100%. All right, well, uh, we'll check in with you periodically, but thanks for joining, and uh, good luck out there. Rachel, here's my question. If I go down to 15%, do we have a deal? Do you want a partner who's not that vested in it? Robert, we have a deal. Done. Uh -huh. All right. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, congratulations. I just can't even believe that I started totally broke, selling my kids' hand-me-downs in a little over a year, and I'm here as a mom with three young boys, and I made this work, and I made my company a success, and I'm so proud of myself and my family. Thank you for jumping in to the Shark Tank Podcast. Please subscribe to the show on iTunes and head over to sharktankpodcast.net to get the show notes from each episode and join the free Shark Tank Insiders list. You can also find us on Instagram and Facebook at Shark Tank Podcast and on Twitter at Shark Tank PDcast.